Hello, my name is Dr. Shawnee Samuel. I'm a field application specialist for photometrics, and this is an overview of electrophysiology. Electrophysiology is a scientific discipline that studies the electrical properties of cells. In the clinical lab, doctors test for the normal function of cardiac cells. In the research lab, the electrical properties of a cell or a region of cells are studied, paying focused attention to the ions of the extracellular matrix. The cell derives many of its electrical properties from the cell membrane. The cell membrane is made of a lipid bilayer that acts as an electrical insulator. Ions, namely potassium, sodium, and calcium, hold various charges. Ions move from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. The net charge difference between the inside and the outside of the cell is known as the cell's membrane potential. Transmembrane proteins allow the ions to cross the extracellular matrix and back in. This happens in various ways. Passive diffusion requires no additional energy input from the cell. Ions will cross the membrane individually through openings or pores in the, in the proteins. Active diffusion, the same thing happens, yet requires some energy input from the cell. Facilitated diffusion relies on a ligand binding to that protein to enable the ions to cross. While there are several equations that can be used, uh, the, the Nernst equation is perhaps the most popular and widely used. Once the flow of ions has been stabilized and the charge uh, inside and the outside of the cell are the same, equilibrium is said to be reached. That equilibrium is associated with a specific voltage membrane potential. The Nernst equation will relate the concentration of ions inside and outside of the cell to the recorded potential that is measured. R is the gas constant, T is the temperature in Kelvin, Z is the charge of the ion, the specific one in question. So if you are talking about sodium, it would be plus one, or if you're talking about calcium, it would be plus two. F is, Ver is Faraday's constant. And the natural log of the concentration outside of the cell versus inside of the cell. When making potential recordings, targeting the specific cell is difficult since cells will go closely together and the neighboring cell may not be the target. A way to measure individual cells must be utilized. Glass pipettes are heated and pulled to have an extremely fine tip, <coughs> excuse me, to have an extremely fine tip that's capable of locking in on one cell to take the potential recordings. There are various methods used in electrophysiology research lab, uh, but all will fall within the, the following two categories. Intracellular electrophysiology experiments rely on taking the electrical information from one cell, whereas extracellular electrophysiology recordings involve obtaining conductivity information from a group of cells or neighboring cells. Voltage clamping and current clamping are two similar techniques that are used in electrophysiology labs today. In current clamping, a signal generator applies a voltage to the cell, which generates some change in the potential, which is then measured. In voltage clamping, a desired potential is named by the researcher. The signal generator applies a voltage, which causes the cell membrane, to, the potential to shift. A recording electrode will measure the potential changes and a feedback loop is generated between the signal generator and the recording electrode, adjusting the output voltage to only make up for the difference between the recorded potential and the desired potential. Patch clamping is an intracellular electrophysiology technique that is extremely popular in the electrophysiology research laboratory. Patch clamping alone is a diverse technique, but in brief, a micropipette is used to target a cell, and negative pressure inside that tip is applied to get a seal onto the cell membrane. Patch clamping is used to study the ion flow and the membrane potential of, of the cell membrane. There are variations on the patch clamping technique, and some are shown here. 
The cell attached method is perhaps the most simple. Negative pressure is applied to the pipette in order to make a form a seal between the micropipette and the cell wall. That section of the of the cell membrane can be removed from that cell to form the inside out method. Or additional volume from the inside of the cell can be sucked into the micropipette for the old, for the whole cell method. Additionally, the outside out method can be can be performed by starting with the whole cell method and retracting part of the part of the membrane so that the outside of the cell is still outside the the micropipette. A perforated membrane can be created such that cytosolic material can flow between the micropipette and back into the cell. Multi-electrode options include multiple electrodes on the same cell and multiple electrodes within the field of cells. Here are some examples of patch clamping in literature. On the left, uh, a group at the University of Tennessee College of Medicine studied the voltage-activated potassium conductance uh, as it affects the output neurons GABA. On the right, at Australia, at Australia National University, the specific membrane capacitance of neurons which measured, was measured in cortical pyramidal neurons, spinal cord neurons, and hippocampal neurons with and without a coating. These images will give you an idea of what images of patch clamping looks like under the microscope. Imaging and electrophysiology is an important part of the process for many laboratories. There are discrete parts of the electrophysiology experiment that require imaging, each with its own challenges. First, Visualization of the cells must be done in order to make the connection between the cell and the microelectrode. Due to low contrast of the cells against the background in traditional wide field techniques, this can be very challenging. Next, targeting the specific cell type is required to obtain relevant data. To do this, fluorescence microscopy is often used to target specific cell types. DIC, dot gradient, and oblique lighting are all used in the electrophysiology laboratory. However, differential interference contrast, or Nomarski contrast, is perhaps the most used. Fluorescence techniques are the area, are the area of electrophysiology where the most variety can be found. Single wavelength microscopy shines a single wavelength of light at a time to excite specific cell types. Multiple channels can be overlaid on top of each other to show structural features within the cell, as shown on the right. Two-photon microscopy uses successive pulses of low-energy photons in order to target cells deeper into the tissue than what would normally be achieved with single-wavelength microscopy. Finally, uh, calcium is very important for Signal transduction in, in neurons is often targeted with fluorescent ligands to visualize its location in and around certain organelles. Stepping back to look at contrast enhancement techniques, one of the most popular, again, is differential interference contrast. This is all made possible with the Nomarski prism that's shown here. The prism consists of two parts. One part splits the light to be parallel to the surface of the prism, and the other part orients the optical axis to be oblique to the surface of the prism, generating a focal point that's outside of the prism. Light comes in and is split into two parts. Those waveforms interact with the sample and are then later recombined, causing constructive and destructive interference, which makes denser areas uh, look more dark in the sample. Dot gradient contrast imaging also improves contrast in the edges and the fine details of cells. Incoming light is first segmented by going through a special aperture uh, in, that's in the light path. That segmented light then passes through a diffusion screen that refills the illumination path but creates a gradient of light where one side has a majority of the light and that tapers off to be uh, less intense on the other side. Successive images are taken by rotating the unit 
illuminating different features in one image that are that are lost in another image. This is an example of what dot gradient contrast imaging can can look like. The first five images, the entire first row and the first two images on the on the second row, are each with a different rotation of the dot gradient accessory. The bottom right hand image is a combination of all of the images put together that has greater detail than any of the one single images that were taken up top. Fluorescence microscopy has several variations in electrophysiology and the Jablonski, the Jablonski diagram on the bottom right hand side can be used to explain what's happening. In single wavelength microscopy, a single photon of high energy light is used to excite electrons in the fluorophore. That takes them from the ground state to the excited state. To get rid of that additional energy of being in the excited state, they vibrate, rotate, and most notably fluoresce at a specific wavelength specific to that fluorophore. Two photon microscopy, also referred to as multi-photon microscopy, capitalizes on the phenomena that successive photons of lower energy can produce the same fluorophore emission response as one pulse of the higher energy photon. This happens on the femtosecond time scale in order to be additive, but multi-photon imaging has the advantage of being able to image deeper within the sample because the photon energy is the most intense at the focal plane. This means that the surface cells will not be excited. This was data collected in a multi-lab experiment that looked at the long-term in vitro tracking of exonal morphology and the activity with high spatiotemporal uh, resolution. They measured the conduction velocity changes over a 95-day period with some very interesting results. This is another example of fluorescence microscopy that came from the Sanford Burnham Priebus Institute. They looked at the little known electrophysiological properties of induced pluripotent neuronal stem cells, including the resting membrane potential, action potential, sodium ion and potassium ion channels, as well as other things. Improving the efficiency of patch clamping using fluorescence is an area that's currently being studied by several groups. On the left, an example with quantum dots is shown. Quantum dots are fluorescent nanoparticles that can be coated on top of or impregnated within the patch clamp pipette. Imaging these pipette tips separately from the labeled cell can give some really interesting fluorescent images of the various types of patch clamps that can be made. In this method, uh, whole cell patch clamp images with the cell and pipette are demonstrated with hippocampal neurons. On the right, another area being focused on is robotic patch clamping. This example was done at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where algorithms have been written to automatically attach a labeled cell with a fluorescently labeled patch pipette. This technique is especially challenging and work is still being done to improve the technique, but it goes a long way toward error-free patches, which is highly desired. Calcium imaging is a branch of fluorescence microscopy that aims to visualize free calcium in and around the cell. Synthesized probes will chelate with free calcium in order to produce a fluorescent molecule. There is much variety in this, in this technique, but the calcium indicators are either chemically made and administered to the cell population of interest, or they are created via transduction. This is a list of many of the common calcium indicators that are in use. This table is a little old, so this is not an exhaustive list. However, some of the most common are GCAMP6, uh, Fura, and Fluo. This is a very cool image that resulted from the calcium imaging from the University of Pennsylvania, who looked at the circuitry of the retina at the cellular and the subcellular level. They combined two photon microscopy with calcium imaging to identify five different neuron classes in the adult mouse retina. Another technique that has been adapted in electrophysiology is the field of optogenetics. A specific cell type is targeted by genetic transfection. 
these transfected cells will synthesize proteins that respond to light. This technique is more specific than electrical stimulation. It has been found that optogenetics can be used to initiate a cellular response or inhibit that same process. Optogenetics has been used to do some very interesting work recently. Uh, a list of some of the really interesting things that optogenetics has come out with over the last 10 years uh, has been published and you can look at it at the link below. Some of these highlights include reactivating memories with light and restoring sight to blind mice. That example can be, can be seen on the right hand side here. Researchers at the University of Bern, Switzerland studied light sensitivity of intact photoreceptor cells in the inner retina, which are hypothesized to continue functioning even after the outer retina has undergone significant photoreceptor degradation. This is a complical image and the white arrows represent functioning rod bipolar cells in the inner retina even after the outer retina are shown not to function. In the established electrophysiology laboratory, you will find various equipment necessary for research. Not all items here are utilized in every single laboratory, but each component plays a role in getting the necessary information from your sample. The micropipette manipulator is used to hold and move the pipette with tight control of the movement. The amplifier takes the small amount of signal recorded from your sample and amplifies it up to a recordable level. The digitizer takes the analog, single, the analog signal that is received from the cell after amplification and converts it to a digital signal that can be charted onto a computer. The stimulus generator sends a voltage through the pipette in order to interact with that sample. The micropipette puller, or the microforge, takes a small glass capillary pipette and heats and pulls it to a fine tip smaller than the width of one cell. The anti-vibration table uh, will eliminate some high frequency vibrations that could add noise to your data. The microscope is almost always used in order to visualize your cell and ensure that your patch has been made a computer to track data, and also a Faraday, a Faraday cage for electrical isolation of your, of your system. The number two concern of the electrophysiologist behind choosing the experimental conditions is minimizing the disturbances in the data. Fluctuations in the recorded data reduce the confidence of that data and must be carefully controlled. Noise, which I talk about in the next slide, can arise from many sources and create potentially unusable data. Series resistance is a loss of the efficiency of the voltage applied to the sample, meaning that the set voltage is not what's being applied to the cell, skewing all results. Imaging in the electrophysiology lab has many of the same concerns as what was stated above. Instrumentation used to image must fit certain qualifications. First, low vibration to reduce the amount of vibrational noise that's added to the system and hence the recorded data. Any imaging system must be extremely sensitive at low photon counts or, and or across a wide wavelength range to capture those really low fluorescing fluorophores that may happen at a non-optimal visible wavelength. Next, uh, some of these events are highly dynamic and having a camera that has a fast speed uh, can go a long way in order to visually capturing those events. And finally, some grounding pins embedded onto the camera will help with isolation of that camera. Noise falls into four main categories, thermal, dielectric, shot noise, and excess noise. A description of each and some of the common uh, remediation strategies are listed here. Thermal noise, dielectric noise, and shot noise can mostly be eliminated with the selection of quality materials. However, access noise is the area most electrophysiologists will stress about the most because there are a few different types of noise associated within the umbrella category of access. Electrode noise can be remediated by selecting some low noise patch clamp pipettes and always making sure that your 
your pipette is debris free. Improved techniques for patch clamping can go a long way in order to reduce electrode noise. Vibrational noise is noise in the data due to the small vibrations in the system. Selecting equipment that uh, is fanless can go a long way toward doing that, but also using an anti-vibration table and quality micro manipulators. Beyond that, however, the selection of the, the area used to conduct your experiment in can also play a major, a major role in reducing the vibrational noise. If your laboratory is nearby a construction site, a generator, maybe an, ele uh, an elevator, these should all be carefully minimized in order to reduce the amount of vibrational noise that's associated with your, with, with your data. Finally, seal noise is a result of the poor contact between the cell membrane and the pipette that's being used. Improving your laboratory technique by applying positive pressure as your pipette tip gets closer to the cell and then applying a small amount of negative pressure in order to make your gigaohm seal to the cell membrane can also help to reduce the amount of seal noise. In conclusion, the electrical properties of cells allow for the transport of ions across the cell membrane. Electrophysiological techniques have enhanced our knowledge of neurological as well as neuromuscular diseases. With knowledge of how specific drugs can affect membrane potential and cellular function, clinicians can apply these techniques studied in the electrophysiology laboratory and apply them toward disease remediation and prevention. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to read additional technical notes on electrophysiology as well as other applications, go to the Q Imaging and Photometrics websites or follow the links on this page.